Our next two speakers will talk about another basic human right, freedom of expression. Freedom of religion is an important part of freedom of expression, but all too frequently, we see free speech curtailed due to religious concerns. Our first speaker to address this topic is Pragna Patel, a founding member of South All Black Sisters and a co-founder of Women Against Fundamentalism. An NSS honorary associate, Pragna is a passionate secularist campaigner, and in 2010, she received the Irwin Prize for Secularist of the Year on behalf of South All Black Sisters. Please join me in welcoming Pragna. I was wondering where that noise was coming from. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for inviting me, NSS. It's a real pleasure to be back um, amongst friends and allies. Um, as many of you know, uh, or will be aware, this is the 30th anniversary of the fatwa against Salman Rushdie. The event also marked the beginning of South All Black Sisters' struggle against religious fundamentalism. It is a struggle that has grown in an urgency as dominant fundamentalist, orthodox, and conservative religious leaderships that I collectively refer to as the religious right have consolidated transnational networks and gained prominence and power using the banner of religious freedom. From our very inception in 1979, so this is our 40th anniversary this year, South All Black Sisters has organized autonomously as a secular, feminist, anti-racist, anti-communalist group. But more than anything, we took our black feminist identity for granted. Even though it was contested, the term black was accepted in those days as a secular, unifying identity that enabled us to forge connections and solidarity in our struggles against racism and gender-based oppression that transcended divisions of class, ethnicity, caste, and religion. But 1989 changed all that. Our belief in a political black identity was shaken to its core by the frenzy surrounding Rushdie and the publication of the Satanic Verses. Very quickly, the media sought, sought out so-called Muslim religious leaderships, the more fundamentalist, the better, to pit against the liberal white establishment. Of course, these leaderships obliged by calling for Rushdie's death and by taking legal action to, to ban what they deemed to be a blasphemous book, even though many had not read it. South All Black Sisters was the first feminist organization in the UK to respond to what we considered to be the resurgence of religious fundamentalism worldwide. On 9th March, we organized a meeting with the Labour Party Women's Section in South Hall to, to celebrate International Women's Day. And to do that, we decided to discuss fundamentalism and its impact on women's struggles across the world. At the end of that meeting, South All Black Sisters issued a statement in support of Rushdie. I'm going to read the statement out today in full because it still forms the basis of our vision of feminism today. We said, as a group of women of many religions and none, we would like to express our solidarity with Salman Rushdie. Women's voices have been largely silent in the debate where battle lines have been drawn between liberalism and fundamentalism. Often it has been assumed that the views of local community leaders are our views, and their demands are our demands. We reject this absolutely. We have struggled for many years in this country and across the world to express ourselves as we choose, within and outside our communities. We will not be dictated to by fundamentalists. Our lives will not be defined by community leaders. We will take up our right to determine our own destinies, not limited by religion, culture, or nationality. We believe that religious worship is an individual matter, 
and that the state should not foster one religion above any other. We call upon the government to abolish the outdated blasphemy law and to defend without reservation freedom of speech. This foundational statement was the basis upon which Women Against Fundamentalism was formed by many of us on 6th May 1989. It was a network of black and white feminists brought together to challenge fundamentalism in all religions and to work in solidarity with women and other human rights defenders internationally. We defined fundamentalism as modern political movements that manipulate religion for political goals. We recognize that at its center lies support of the patriarchal family, the control of women's minds and bodies, and the desire to control or silence dissent, and to delegitimize and oust secular, liberal, and syncretic cultural traditions from within. Our first act of defiance was the now iconic WAF, Women Against Fundamentalism, protest in Parliament Square. Standing there, facing a vast sea of angry young Muslim men, led by opportunistic Muslim clerics and community leaders with transnational fundamentalist links, we drew connections between Rushdie's right to dissent and the feminist tradition of dissenting. We believe that doubting and dissenting lies at the heart of the feminist movement and that freedom of speech is necessary to secure private as well as public liberty. This is why our placards of support for Salman Rushdie consisted of slogans such as, here to stay, here to doubt. Fear is your weapon, courage is ours. Our tradition, struggle, not submission. At that moment, I think we understood that these words were the only real weapons we have in our struggle against illiberal identity politics and the patriarchal power of religious absolutism that is on display everywhere across the world. Ironically, at the same time that we were protesting against the anti-Rushdi marches, we also found ourselves confronting a small group of racists and fascists who had also used the moment to parade anti-Muslim racism. They were outnumbered by about one to 2,000. And so they turned their venom against us as the easier target. So there we were, one minute fending off aggressive and violent Muslim men who lunged at us, and the next confronting the Nazi salutes and fascist flag-waving group of young white men and women. In a way, that moment perfectly encapsulated what Women Against Fundamentalism was about. It was a visual representation of our po political location challenging both ethnic minority fundamentalists and white fascists at one and the same time. During the Rushdie affair, we were at pains to point out that whilst free speech does have limits when it becomes incitement to hatred and violence, the demand for the extension of blasphemy laws, which, has, which had historically privileged Christianity in the UK, was not one of them. Our resistance was based on the realization that the first targets of a fundamentalist politics of causing offense are women, sexual minorities, and other religious minorities within religions. In the years that have followed, we have seen how the religious right has used religious minority status to demand religious freedom, which in reality masks a grab for power over people and resources. From the 90s onwards, we have witnessed with alarming frequency attempts made by Muslim, Christian, Hindu, and Sikh religious right to clamp down on dissent and to impose a strict religious identity on followers, if necessary, by force and intimidation. In doing so, they have blurred the distinction between protest and intimidation, which is deliberately used to terrorize and censor democratic debate. In 2005, for example, Sikh fundamentalists, some of whom were masquerading as Sikh human rights defenders, forced the play Besti about rape in a Gurdwara off the stage in Birmingham 
and sent the playwright Gurpreet Bhatti into hiding after protesting that Sikh sensibilities had been hurt. In 2006, Hindu fundamentalists forced the closure of an exhibition of paintings in London by the Indian painter M.F. Hussain, claiming that Hindu sentiment, sentiments had been offended. And more recently, the Hindu right has successfully blocked much needed equality legislation on caste by claiming contrary to the evidence that it represents, I quote, a wholly unjustified wave of anti-Hindu outrage and indignation tantamount to the religious persecution of Hindu Sikhs and Jains. Clearly, the routine invocation of the right not to be offended, a right which, as we know, doesn't actually exist, has proved to be an enduring post-fatwa legacy. What we are left with, then, is a growing acceptance of religious identity politics, of which there are two particular aspects that I want to highlight. First, the largely secular nature of the British state, although it's not formally so, is becoming increasingly entangled in the religious sphere through the policy of multi-faithism. Multi-faithism is a mixture of the simultaneous politics of religious co-option into the state apparatus and repression and censorship of dissenting voices from within communities. Using the spaces opened up by multi-faithism and by growing inequality and a growing justice gap due to privatization and the retreat of the welfare state, we see the religious right in all minority communities attempting to legitimize their role as so-called authentic religious and community leaders and as providers of welfare services and arbiters of justice. The point is that they are using minority status to not only maintain power and reinforce structures of inequality and discrimination, but also to communalize and desecularize spaces and struggles, including left, anti-racist, and black feminist struggles. This anti-secular ascendancy is also the product of the war on terror and the state's need to create a moderate religious leadership, which involves granting autonomy over community affairs in exchange for public acquiescence on the question of terrorism and public order. Secondly, what we see arising is a social contract based on hyper-masculinized and patriarchal sexual order. It is being created in ways in which the rights, especially of minority women and girls, are endangered. In this new social order, women and girls are recast as the subjects of religious community leaderships rather than as autonomous actors with citizenship rights within a democratic system. This has led to a number of adverse consequences for minority women in particular, and we've seen this in our work at Southfield Black Sisters. They include the following. First of all, we've seen an increase in gender-based violence and discrimination against women. Secondly, we've seen a rise in the policing of female sexuality through the imposition of strict dress codes and the practice of gender segregation in schools and other public spaces. My own experience in 2017 of intervening in the Al Hijra Court of Appeal case involving gender segregation is a case in point. Thirdly, we've seen concerted campaigns by Muslim fundamentalists, often in alliance with Jewish and Christian fundamentalists, to restrict Muslim children's access to parts of the school curriculum that promote awareness, inclusion, and equality. And I have the scandal around the Parkfield School in Birmingham in mind when I say this. They argue that sex education and the teaching of LBGT rights, for example, goes against so-called Islamic values, which they have come to define. This is a damaging impact on all children, but especially girls. Fourthly, we have seen the vigorous use of so-called conversion narratives to control female sexuality. For example, both Sikh and Hindu fundamentalist movements have mobilized effectively around the issue of so-called forced conversions of Hindu and Sikh girls by Muslim men. Right-wing Sikh male youths, for instance, have even organized protests against interfaith marriages that take place in Gurdwaras. They literally disrupt or stop the weddings through the strategy of intimidation and threats. 
but the wider mischief that is being perpetrated is the attempt to impose a puritanical notion of Sikhism that is intolerant, devoid of compassion, and inhuman in its practice. This is a really chilling strategy that seeks to place the maintenance of religious purity over fundamental freedoms and rights. Unsurprisingly, it is mainly based on the control of female sexuality. Fifthly, there is a growing pressure on women to voluntarily access systems of community or religious arbitration for family disputes, including in circumstances where they're subject to violence and forced marriage. And these alternative religious arbitration systems are seen as an alternative to secular law. The sixth point is that there are increasingly attempts by fundamentalists to opt out of equality's duties, often by marshalling other human rights, such as freedom of religious belief. It never ceases to amaze me how the religious right castigate those of us who invoke secular human rights law and call us westernized for advancing the rights of women, while they themselves selectively use human rights to restrict freedoms and rights of others. A paradox that I think we need to increasingly uh, challenge. In conclusion, what is clear is that fundamentalism causes multiple harms. It uses threats, violence, and vigilante activity, as well as existing cultural, legal, educational, and political spaces to clamp down on dissent and to subvert laws and policies so that they align with fundamentalist norms. In this way, soft and hard tactics are utilized, sometimes simultaneously, to establish a culture of intolerance, fear, and censorship. We clearly face an uphill task, not just in our attempts to stand up to the global rise of the religious right, but also to the rapid rise of the far right. Undoubtedly, there are parallels between the two. Both are authoritarian political movements that cash in on disaffection and mobilize racist or religious discourses to gain and consolidate power without accountability. Both pursue a politics of division, violence, and at times genocide. And when combined with the processes of austerity, unbridled free market capitalism, and the destruction of the environment, both create lethal spaces in which patriarchal and racial violence, ethnic and religious cleansing, inequality, intolerance, hatred, and bigotry flourish. What this tells us is that we need to urgently create a secular democratic politics based on our shared common humanity and the values of diversity, equality, tolerance, compassion, and individual freedom. What this tells us is that we need to draw inspiration from thousands of ordinary people around the world standing up to authoritarian and fundamentalist forces and for secular principles. We must utilize all the cultural, social, legal, and political spaces at our disposal to resist fundamentalism around the world in an interrelated way that faces many directions at the same time. As I speak, I'm reminded of a line by a character from the early 90s film, My Beautiful Laundrette, which was set in the late 70s and scripted by the writer Hanif Qureshi. In the film, two disillusioned secular Pakistani men are engaged in conversation against a backdrop of Thatcherite Britain, racism, and the Islamization of Pakistan under General Zia al Haq. One turns to the other and says that the real struggle is the struggle for knowledge and truth. And with some urgency, he says, we must have knowledge because without knowledge, how do we know who is doing what to whom? Dissent is vital to our quest for knowledge and for human progress. It is the lifeblood of any meaningful democracy because the absence of dissent is ignorance, totalitarianism, despotism, and tyranny. Thank you. Thank you.